Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Huck. Today I am doing my review for Ship of Destiny by Robin Hobb. This is the third and final book in her Live Ship Traders trilogy, which takes place in the realm of the Elderlings. If you're watching this video, I'm going to assume that you probably already know what this series is about. You probably have read the first two books in this series because this video is going to have some spoilers for the first two books. There won't be any, well, that's not true. There, with the first half of this video will not have spoilers for this book, although there will be spoilers for the first two books in the series because to be able to talk about this, I'm gonna have to talk about things that happened in the previous books. But then at a certain point, I do have some spoilery things that I want to say about this book because I have some issues with the way that it ended. Uh, but I will warn you when the spoilers are going to begin, most of this is going to be a non-spoiler review. But if you have not read the first two books in this series, the first one is Ship of Magic and the second is The Mad Ship, uh, and you don't want to be spoiled for those books, then you probably don't want to watch this video because there are going to be spoilers for the first two. So you've been sufficiently warned. So just to set the stage for where we are starting off with this book, where we left off from book two, um, Althea, Brashen, and Amber are on Paragon, who they have re-outfitted, and they are off to go find and get back Vivacia. Wintro is on the live ship Vivacia with Captain Kennet, and Wintro may be dying from serpent poison from freeing the serpent she who remembers. From that whole encounter with the serpent, um, all of the crew of Vivacia now believe that Kennet can control serpents, which just adds to the mythos of Captain Kennet. Malta, her brother Selden, and her mother Kefria, as well as the Rain Wilder Rain and the Satrap, are in the Rain Wild hiding from the chaos that is going on in Bingtown after Bingtown has now fallen. Malta tried to free the dragon from her cocoon underground, causing a cave in. Um, she found the Satrap, and now the two of them, as well as his companion, are in a boat floating down the Rainwild River trying to survive. And Rain and Selden succeeded in freeing the dragon and are now in danger of being crushed in a cave-in. Veronica chose to stay in Bingtown while it is in chaos to try and help maintain order, and Cirilla is in Bingtown as well, trying to gain control over Bingtown. So after the second book in the series, The Mad Ship, this one was a bit of a letdown for me. I loved The Mad Ship. There was so much character development that happened in that book, and it was so fascinating. This one, feel like it backslid a little bit in how interesting it was. It was very slow paced. The first half of it, I felt was kind of like unnecessary a lot of the stuff or it could have been done much more quickly. Sometimes I do feel like it is more excessive than it really needs to be and it harms the pacing of the book and how engaging the book is as a whole. It really wasn't until the second half or maybe the last third or so of the book that I felt like it really got to the point of the story, that the story really found what it was trying to do. But by that point we had used up about 600 pages that were unnecessarily extensive um, and detailed, and then in that last 300 pages it felt like the story just slammed in a bunch of information and a lot of action um, that could have been drawn out more. So I felt like the pacing for this was kind of off. Something that I realized with this book in my reading experience of it was that I really wasn't emotionally invested in the story or the characters until the last like two to three hundred pages of the book, but the way that I've been enjoying it has been more from a bit of a distance and kind of appreciating how interesting it is, how well done it is, how well crafted it is, but I have not been invested or connected to it. And it wasn't until those last like 200 pages that I felt an emotional investment or connection to these characters. I think part of why that is that I felt more connected to the characters towards the end was because one, that was where all of the action was. There was a lot of movement throughout these books, but very little action until the end. Um, and the stakes were high, but not 
um, urgent feeling to me. And so it wasn't until the end when everything came slamming into place that the stakes started to feel more urgent. I also think that I became more invested towards the end because up until that point, the characters have been very far flung. They've been relatively siloed. There are kind of pockets where you'll get like two or three characters that are together, but those are characters that don't often have a lot of conflict between them. Um, so again, all of the conflict was really held until the end. And it was when those characters and those storylines that I've been following for so long finally came together that I found that connection and that real interest and caring for the characters because it was the interaction between those characters that made it so much more interesting and made their um, experiences more poignant. And then one last thing about the pacing of this book is that the story felt like it reached a conclusion and then there was still a hundred pages after that. And this book, these books are always a little bit longer than I think that they need to be. And this was a very clear example. So of the 900 pages of this book, there were only about maybe 200 pages that I was actually really excited about. One of the things that I also want to mention in this book, there is a rape scene which does get somewhat graphic, um, so that's something to be aware of. There was also a rape scene in the second book which I actually forgot to mention for that one, so I am sorry about that that I forgot to put a warning on that one for it. And rape is something in books that I feel like is very commonly overused, um, and in the second book I didn't really like the way that it was handled. With this third book, I don't necessarily know if it was handled well, but I think it may have been handled better than it was in the second book. Um, but it did also feel like it came, really came out of left field um, in terms of like why characters did that. Um, and it didn't really make sense to me in terms of the story and why that was necessary um, as part of the story. So I just was not a fan. And the last thing that I want to talk about before I go into spoilers is the pirate Kennet and his character arc because I was very disappointed with the character arc that Kennet went through. Um, he had been a really interesting an antagonist throughout the series and up until this book I would have called him an antagonist rather than a villain. I thought he was a really interesting character. He is a bad person in a lot of ways but he has he's just he's very interesting and just fast it was fascinating to read about but in this book we find out a lot more of his backstory and about the trauma that he has been through and instead of adding to his character um, and giving you know a more three-dimensional understanding of him I felt like the trauma of his backstory was used to flatten his character and make him less dynamic um, than he had been before and I understand that having to confront uh, things from his past and be reminded of this trauma could uh, trigger him to act in ways that seem unexpected or out of character, but it really felt to me like it just flattened out his character and was used to force situations to make the plot move in a certain direction instead of being true to the character, um, and I just really didn't like that. So all of that being said, clearly I had quite a few problems with this book. I do really um, enjoy her writing, but this book specifically was such a disappointment to me and it felt like so much build up for so little payoff. Each of the books in this series was about 900 pages and by the end I had a feeling of like, was it all worth it? I don't, I don't know if nearly 3,000 pages of book was worth it for this ending. So now I am going to be getting into some spoilery things. These really specifically are just spoilers about the ending of the book because I have a lot of opinions. I am not happy about the ending. So if you have not read this book and you don't want to be spoiled for the end, then stop watching. But if you want to hear me rant about the ending and why I hated it, by all means, keep watching. So first of all, one of my problems with the ending 
was how tidily it all came together at the end. It was just like too perfect and too tidy and just like everybody falling into their little boxes and everything ends up happily ever after. And what really bothered me about that is that it didn't match the rest of the series. This whole series was so sprawling and so messy. And I don't mean messy in terms of the writing, but messy in terms of like what the characters went through was so messy that the ending was so tidy, it just like didn't match. In general, I don't have a problem with like tidy endings or like happily ever after kind of endings as long as it matches the rest of the book or series and the tone but this one it really didn't match and I just was like so frustrated with how tidy everything was and then the one thing that wasn't tidy was Althea and Vivacia, that Althea does not get Vivacia and now she lives on Paragon with Brashen and I was so mad about that for so many reasons. By the end of The Mad Ship, I kind of suspected that Althea was probably not going to get Vivacia, even though I was like, if she doesn't get Vivacia, I'm gonna be real mad because we I read all of these books. The whole point of this entire series is her trying to get Vivacia, get that one ship and she doesn't get the ship. But I did kind of like know that that probably was going to happen. But the thing that really bothered me about this is that Althea kind of has to like give up on her dream of having her own ship and her own live ship and goes to live on Paragon with Brashen. One of the big themes throughout this series has been these really strong female characters. There are some really great female characters throughout the series. They're all so different and they're all so interesting and they have such good arcs, especially um, Malta and Kafria. Both have really interesting arcs. And Althea, she started as a really strong independent character, but she still had her own growth. And Ronica is also such a strong character. And all of these female characters were so interesting and had so much strength and character to them and one of the themes was also about these women finding their independence and finding their strength especially in Malta and Kafria's storylines about realizing that they want to have uh, that like self-determination and that they want to have control over their own lives and they can have control over their own lives. And one of the themes for Althea was this like strong desire to have independence, to have her own ship and be able to captain her own ship and prove that she was a good sailor and a good captain and that she didn't want to uh, sacrifice essentially her career for getting married and having children and all of that. And that's essentially what happens to her. Like, I get it that she doesn't have to stay in Bingtown, that she is going to be able to still sail. She'll be on Paragon with Brashen and they will sail together. But it still is a story of her being a strong, career-minded, independent woman who has to give up her own ambition to essentially just follow the man in her life. And she doesn't get to captain her own ship, which was pretty much her one dream. She now has to live on Paragon with Brashen. And I was just really mad that like, of all of the things like that were going on in this series, that was the thing that she decided to not end up like the way that you wanted to end up. Everyone else gets these like obnoxiously tidy endings. It just felt very counter to all of the build-up and all of the themes of these characters and these stories and I was just so mad about it. And the other reason that I was really mad about her ending up on Paragon is because Kenneth is now a part of Paragon. Like I get that Paragon is an amalgamation of two dragons and like generations of traitors and so he has his own personality but still Kenneth is very much a part of Paragon to the point where the figurehead has Kenneth's eyes and that just 
like I just hate that so much that now Althea has to live the rest of her life on board a ship that has the same eyes as her rapist, that has like absorbed the spirit or essence or consciousness of her rapist. So between those two things it felt like such a wrong way to end this character's story and it made it feel like that whole storyline, this whole series was for nothing. By the end of it I was just sitting there being like what was the point of this? Was any of this worth it? It didn't feel like it and I just was like I read almost 3,000 pages worth of book for this? For this. This is what I read this for. Like I just, that ending just felt so wrong. The way that I think this should have ended, if you want to know, is that I think that Althea should have gotten Vivacia and Brashen should have lived on Vivacia with Althea and like go back to being a second mate. Like I get it that he's a great captain and all of that, but you know, maybe he should give up his dreams. Why does Althea have to give up her dreams? Anyways, the two of them should have been on Vivacia, and then Wintro should have been on Paragon because then, you know, he would be able to be closer to Kennet and Kennet's spirit and Etta could live on there with him. And Paragon has Kennet's eyes and, you know, Wintro can feel like he's close to Kennet and honoring Kennet's spirit and can, I don't know, look into his eyes whenever he wants to and then Althea doesn't have to live on a ship that, you know, embodies part of her rapist. I feel like that would have been a good conclusion to the series. I think I am probably either completely alone on this or really in the minority because Robin Hobb is pretty much like across the board everybody just adores her and I do think that she is a very good writer in a lot of ways and I have liked other books by her just this one I'm real mad about uh, but please let me know if you agree with me and if you're mad too about this book especially if you're like very mad because I feel like I might be the only person who is mad at all, but especially this mad, because I'm real mad about this. Anyways, thank you all for watching, and until next time, bye.